The Islamic Center of Tennessee presents Inna alhamdulillah hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya Sallallahu alayhi wa salamu ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwajihi wa man wala wa ba'd فإن أستق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحج حج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أيها الأخوة الكرام أخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters I I want to just remind us that even in gathering to hear a muhadhara. There is a sunnah to that. Now I understand this is your local mosque and you come here every day and you have your own places you like to sit. However, if you want to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, this is what he said. When he entered a masjid like this one, his masjid, and he saw people sitting in different places. He didn't like that. He said, why you don't draw yourselves up in rows as the malaika draw themselves up in front of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala O kama qara rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So brothers, I'm advising you just for the few minutes. I'm, me, I will be in and out. You know, one hour, 45 minutes, in and out. The operation is through for the energy, for the sunnah, for the discipline, we should try our best to sit together as brothers. And even the sisters, if there's some sisters, sit together. You know, if you ask the surgeons who work on the brain, <coughs> the microsurgeons, they will tell you the structure of the brain. The brain is made up of different cells. And energy is passing through those cells to create thought. The process is called synapse. This is the process. In scientific terminology, it's called synapse. How the energy travels from one part of the brain to another and forms thought. Without this here synapse, there would be no energy, there would be no complete thought, and the human being would not have the distinction above animals. When Allah he ordered us, in the Allah yuhibbu ladhin yuqatiluna fi sabili safan ka'annahum bunyanum marasus. Subhanallah. Allah is telling us to line up the same way the cells inside the brain is lined up. To carry the energy. Brothers, me I'm not an important person. And it doesn't matter who I am. What matters is what we're going to talk about. This is a session. It's like brain surgery, heart surgery, something that keep you alive, something to bring you back to life, something that makes the difference. Because there are messages now, according to the most recent study, there are 5,336 massages in America. How many? If I was talking money, you would not forget. 5,336 massages. Now, okay, they're not all this size, but it doesn't matter. Allah do not look to the size and the amount. He's looking to the ikhlas and the benefit which come from it. Is right? But 5,336 masjids, when I became a Muslim, there was only 15 masjids in the whole United States. Fifteen. Seven of them was in New York. So where's the rest of them? <laughs> We're done all over. 5,336 now. When I became a Muslim, there was about 1.9 or maybe 2 million immigrant Muslims who came from Yemen, who came from Lebanon, who came from Palestine, who came from Egypt, who came from Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, like that, Turkish. Now, 
there is over 4.2 million Muslims who is either first or second generation immigrants. These are statistics which we, you can, you know, the Homeland Security, they're always stopping me and bothering me. So I'll be checking on their statistics because you know they're watching us more than we watch ourselves. So they got good statistics on the Muslims. So they said now 4.8, 4.3, I'm sorry, million immigrant Muslims and, and 3.2 million new Muslims, Muslim on Judud, reverts like myself. When I became a Muslim, there was only 85,000 reverts in the whole country. And they wasn't even, they don't even know nothing about Aqidah. They don't know nothing about, uh, you know, Sunnah. They don't know nothing about, you know, Mustalahat of Hadith. They don't know no Fiqh. They don't know no Tafsir. They didn't speak the Arabic language, just they know Allah, Muhammad, Quran, Mecca, five pillars, and they didn't even get that right. But there was 85,000. One of them was Malcolm X, and he was only Muslim. Excuse me? Oh, one of those reverts was Malcolm X. And you know, he became a Muslim in Mecca in order to make Hajj, you know that, right? So when he wrote his letter, he was only Muslim 12 days. When he came back to America, two and a half months later, they killed him. But most of the revert Muslims who's in this country today, they came through his word. SubhanAllah, look at that. Somebody who's only Muslim, what, 12 days before he wrote a letter? Somebody, you know, he was only Muslim for two and a half months and then they assassinate him. Maybe he didn't even, I made Hajj with his daughter. She said, maybe my father didn't even know the whole Fatiha. Maybe, she don't know. But see how many people from his example and his words, how many people that enter Islam, subhanAllah, still coming. So now brother, we have 6.8, 6 6.89, close to 7 million Muslims in North America. Six million, United States of America. 5,336 massages. My question is, where is the community? What's my question? A building is not a community. Just like if you go in a hospital, you say hospital. But when you go in there, ain't no doctors there. There ain't no organization there. Nobody's at the desk. There's no machines there, no nothing there, but because it's a hospital, you just gonna sit there all night and wait for somebody or not? What, would you? You go to a supermarket and say, supermarket, Walmart, Hallmart, Halal Mart, whatever it says, but you go inside, they ain't got no registers, ain't no food on the shelf, no nothing like that, you gonna still be walking up and down the aisles? I'm asking you, no. So then, where is the community? Where are the families who make up the unit of the community? And where are the individuals who themselves is in charge of those families? And those families, with those individuals who form the units of the community, who's the leader? I didn't say who's the imam, we already know who's the imam. All the masjids, all 5,336 masjids, you know they have imam, right? Probably some of them, they got like four imams. You know, they got imam, imam, backup imam, backup, 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 big imam, small imam, imam with big turban, small turban. They got especially imam khususi. They got this imam, that imam, they got plenty imams. But who is the leader? That means the one that take the resp full responsibility of the community. The one who can command the community. The one who can say, sit down, stand up, move out. Where's the leader? I'm not asking you to answer that question here. You all men, and you know, dealing with men is like difficult because you all got your own egos. And I'm just coming and then I'm leaving. So, you know, on the way out, you don't like what I said? Talk to me outside in the parking lot. 
But for right now, I'm asking some questions, then I'm gonna answer some. You like it, take the medicine. You don't like it, do like you do, the dentist say. Just leave your teeth alone, they just go away. So just don't even answer the questions. Just keep going like this, going and you see. These masjids will become white elephants. You ever seen a white elephant? I'm asking, you, did you ever see a white elephant? Huh? This means very strange if you see one, right? 20 years from now, if we don't form a community, these places will become white elephants. Nobody's gonna make this masjid into a dance hall. It used to be movie theater before, right? Now it is a wakaf. It's not going to become dance hall or something like that. It just will not have anybody here. Because the young kids, they ain't gonna be sitting up in here like the OGs be sitting up in here. I know OGs mean uh, old generation, in case you guys don't know. Old, old generation, old gangsters, old guys, old girls, old generation, the kids in the street, they call you what? OG, so don't be getting no attitude if they say, hey, hey, shoot me, shake, OG. Don't be saying, what are you calling me? No, this is respect. There's a respectful name, but it's just from some, you know, I'm Mia. You know, the Egyptians, you understand I'm Mia. If you go to Egypt, you're trying to talk in some, in some classical Arabic, they be think something's wrong with you because they don't talk no classical Arabic. They do, they have some knowledge, but in the street, they say, they say, nah, how do that? Is, 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 did you know? Whatever they're talking like that. So in the street here, the kids, they also have their own vernacular. And if they say OG, it's respect. Mean that you old generation? They say, hey, tell the kid, hey, hey, chill out, man. OG is over here. So if you go to most of the masjids today, for Fajr, there ain't nobody there but the OGs. Big masjids filled up for Juma from wall to wall, front to back, over here, upstairs, all that, Juma. But, but for Asr, after the say, Yom Juma, you know, Friday, Asr prayer, how many people you think is there? Maybe 10, 15 people, it's khalas, it's gone. 200, uh, Juma, 200 cars in the parking lot. Asr, it's just uh, five, 10, five, six cars there. Fajr, how many people you think is there? 10, 15, 20, maybe. Because America is a big dunya. And people have many excuses. Shaitan, he have a lot of excuses at Fajr time. Oh, it's too far. Oh, I ain't got no gas. Oh, I gotta be at work. Oh, I pray right here. Oh, it's warm, or oh, it's cold, or oh, it's raining. You know what I'm saying? I got a little place over here, my friend. Oh, I go around the corner. I this, I that. Shaitan, he got a lot of stuff for you at Fajr time. You looking for an excuse? Shaitan, he got at least 15 of them for you. See? But if there's community, if there's discipline, there's accountability, there's commitment, there's investment. If you open up, a, if you have a business and it's supposed to be open up at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's your business, and you're going to make sure somebody have it open or not. It's right or wrong. McDonald's say they open up at seven o'clock. There's people inside McDonald's at six o'clock. They cleaning up and pre putting all the machines on and running up. And at seven o'clock in the morning, McDonald's is open. You ever been to a McDonald's that's not open the time they say? I'm asking you. No, they're open. Walmart, McDonald's, Starbucks, all the places, the hospitals, schools, they open the time they say. Why? Because it's business. So the Muslim, our first business is the prayer. And most of you, you got cars, you ain't catching no bus. So why are you not here at Fajr? Because you ain't accountable. There ain't nobody to tell you. Look in your eyes and look in your face and say, hey, Abdullah, what, what's up with you, man? We ain't see you at Fajr, man, for three mornings. What's, what's going on with you? You can't get no attitude, not if we got a, you know, we got some guys that got bigger attitude than you. You can't get no attitude. Say, I oh, don't be asking me no question. What you mean don't ask you no question, man? You made a commitment here. You're supposed to be here. You're a man, you got a family, you made a commitment here. We want to see you here for the Fajr prayer. You know, this is America, so we can't tell you what the Prophet Sam said. One day, the Prophet Sam made the prayer. After he turned around, he looked and see, 
There were some people wasn't there. He said that if it was not, if it was not, he said, he said he would have. He said if it was not for the women and the children who's inside the homes, I would have. Meaning that he said he would, he did, he never did this. I would have ordered the men to get some, some wood and I burned down the houses of the people who ain't here for Fajr. You, you know that hadith, right? You heard that before, right? This means he was very angry that he don't see the people. This is Medina. He know, he know where everybody lives. So if the Prophet Sallallahu and he's a, he's a prophet of mercy, he's a prophet of mercy, but he get angry when he don't see the men is at the Fajr prayer. So if there is an Amir here, he have the right also to be angry. Why are you not here for the Fajr prayer? You ain't got no excuse. But the problem is that the Muslims, they really don't want discipline. So they want a building, they want Jum'ah, they want, they want Eid, they want to call it Salatul Jum'ah, or they want to call it the prayer, but they don't want Jama'ah. Because Jama'ah is accountability. Jama'ah is a responsibility. Jama'ah is a discipline. You know, in the Quran, you know how many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say the word Ummah? You know, when you say the word Jama'ah, Ummah is a bigger word. But Jama'ah is a descriptive noun for the Ummah. You know, the Ummah is, could be the earth. The Ummah could be everyone on the earth. The Ummah could be those who follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It could be all the human beings. The Ummah could be the Ummah of, of Ibrahim alayhi sallam. Could be the Ummah of a prophet or a Nabi. It could be this Ummah, that Ummah. But the word Ummah in the Quran, it comes 62 times. Allah, he used the word Ummah 62 times. That means it's a very important word. He describing the human beings. We describing those who follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Or this ayah, he says, Auzu billahi min ash-shaitan rajim he says, Kuntum khaira. You know, you heard this verse, right? Kuntum khaira. Ummatan ukhrijat lin nas. Ta'amaruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna lil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. This is the ayah we can discuss. Description Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given directly to us, the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Kuntum, you, plural, you are, Kuntum, Khaira, you are the best. Ummatan, you are the best Ummah. Ukhrijat, evolved out of, taken out of. So that means Allah, He snatched the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu out of the entire Ummah. He snatched this part of the Ummah out and He says, You are the best Ummah evolved for the whole humanity. Why? Then he gives the reason why. What's the, what's the reason why? Ta'maruna bil ma'roof Because you command what is right. And you, and you forbid with your power, you prevent what is evil or wrong. And lastly, because you believe in Allah, because you have a covenant with Allah. Three reasons, right? Because you, have the, you use your power to do what? Command what's good. And you use your power and your resources to do what? To prevent what's evil. And what's the third reason? Because you honor your Iman. You honor your contract with Allah. This is what Iman is. Iman is the honoring of the contract you have with Allah. Because what does it mean? Amana. Amana means what? Trust, right? Amana is trust. And Iman comes from the same verb. So to trust, to have a covenant, to keep the covenant, to have the honor, to maintain, this is Iman, this is Amana. So when Allah says, وَتُؤْمِنُونَ billah, It means all of that too. As Muslims, those are the three reasons why Allah made us the preferred Ummah. And we don't have to go into all the other ayats. I'm not trying here to discuss all of the sabab of the ayats. I'm not trying to give tafsir on the ayats. I'm discussing the issue of Community. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, وَأَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا How many people, they heard that ayah before? Oh, you don't hear that? You don't hear the ayah before? So I asked the question. If I said, how many people here like money? How many men here, they like women? 
How many people here like to have a nice house? How many here would like to have $100 right now because I just came with some money? How many people like that? Everybody sit like that. But now I'm asking you, did you hear the ayah before? Yes, good. Because nobody who can hear, even if they are only seven years old, they heard this ayah. Because it is one of the central ayah in dealing with the discipline of the Muslims. وَاَقْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاَقْتَصِمُوا You know in the Quran when Allah says, فَعْ or وَعْ When he says that, like that, this is a command. فِعْلِ الْعَمْرِ It's a command. You don't have no choice. It's not like, please, think about this. No, this is like an order. وَاَقْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا so, so hold on to the rope which Allah extend to you and do not be divided among yourselves. Let's discuss that for a minute. Because he's talking about what? What are we talking about again? What's the subject today? Community. So Allah says, hold on to the rope that Allah extend to you. Now, there is a general consensus among all the scholars, past and present, that the hablillah means the Quran and the Sunnah. We ain't talking about all the different groups who is recognizing the Quran and the Sunnah. What it means? Habdullah. What does it mean? Quran and Sunnah. So whoever is claiming to love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever is claiming to love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, whoever is claiming to follow the Quran, whoever is claiming to follow his Sunnah, whoever is claiming that, this is the Habdullah. And regarding those who follow in the Habdullah, what's the next order? Wala tafarraku. Now, you know, people who think they're in the right way, people who think they are very religious, they are very disciplined, they have the knowledge, they have the discipline, they got the right school, they got the right scholars, they got the right books, they got the right dress, they got the right kalam, they got this, they got that. Then they say, we the ones that's Allah talking about. We the ones. You guys, you don't look like us. You ain't talking like us. You ain't following like us. You ain't reading our books. You own something else. You guys is Muqtadi. You guys is Kutubi. You guys is Khawariji. You guys is this, you guys is that. You heard those names, right? You heard those names, right? So the Salafis, they don't like the Sufis. The Sufis, they don't like the Salafis. And the Salafis and the Sufis, they don't like the Shi'is. And the Shi'is, they don't like the Sunnis. And the Sunnis, they don't like the Shi'is. And the Ahlul Hadithis, they don't like this one. And then we keep going on and on and on and on and on and on. But what that got to do with the Quran and the Sunnah, and what that has to do with the word Allah says, So if you say, I'm not praying with those guys, don't sit and eat with those guys. You violating this word right here. Because Allah said what? And this la and this verse here, this la and this verse here is irreversible. You cannot put some wala wala. It does he didn't say wala. What he said? Wala tafarraku. This la in this verse here is absolute. It's just absolute. You cannot change it at all. Do not cause any division among the Quran and the Sunnah and the people of the Quran and the Sunnah don't make no divisions. Don't say you better than the other one. Even those people, if somebody commits sins, you ain't better than them. If they commit sins, what we supposed to do regarding them? What we do? If we convict them, what we do? No, we punish. If they do kabaya, they get punished, right? Or did we tell them, uh, uh, make tawbah. But you don't say you better than them. The judge ain't better. The one who make the judgment, he's not better. He don't say, I'm better than you. I'll put you in the jail. I'm going to punish you because I'm better than you. No, he don't say that. He just bring the law, right? The law does not mean that the one who, who put the law is better than you. In Islam, no one better. In the khalaqnakum min dhakari wal unta. He made you male and female, nations and tribes, different colors, different languages. But verily, the best of you is the best in what? 
in their fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, today the Muslims is take out the word la. They say, They take out the la. Why? They say, you know why we, we make farak with those guys? Because they this and they that. Allah, he said, well, that's a farak. So the Muslims, they change it to wafarraku. Brothers and sisters, Islam is a system. You know, some scholars, years ago, they were asked to define Islam. And they did it in a very nice way. I ain't saying this is the only de definition, but it is a definition easy for everybody to remember. The definition they gave is like a poem. They said, Al Islamu istislamu lillahi bitawheed wal inqiyadu lahu bitawati wa ruddu shark wal kufr wa ahlihi. So, how many people here is Arabs or speak the Arabic language? How many people here is Arab or speak the Arabic language? So you understood what, what that is, right? What is the definition? Al-Islam is Islam lillah. Al-Islam is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he's the Rabb. We submit. Whatever he ordered us, we say, Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul It's the Islam lillah. Bit Tawheed. And the way we surrender to Allah, Bit Tawheed. Not any way you feel, Bit Tawheed. Wal inqiyadu lahu bit ta'ati. And to surrender to him completely. To surrender to his orders, what he told us, what he ordered us, what he gave to us to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and to reject all forms of paganism, shirk, wal kufr, rebellion, and disbelief, wa ahlihi. And ahlihi means and all things that come from it, its relatives. This is Islam. Brothers and sisters, Islam is a system of faith which flourishes and depends upon three things. On the earth, Islam as a faith depends on no one except the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Islam on the earth as a civilization, as a society, requires three elements. Family, community, and nation. What's the three elements? Brothers, this is interactive. You ain't paying me nothing, so I'm just telling you, this is my, my setting, I'm telling you, interactive. If you want to pay me, then you ain't even got to participate, just pay. But if you're not paying me, at least you got to participate, because what I'm sitting up here doing, I'm wasting my time, I've come all the way from Philadelphia just to be fooling around, listening to some people looking at me, smiling like I'm crazy. So, how many elements? What's the elements? Family, community, nation. Throughout the years since Islam came into this world, it relied upon those three elements. When Allah sent a prophet, he's an individual, right? But can he do something by himself? No, he cannot do nothing by himself. Allah sent the prophet with a what? Family. And even see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the people that's in his family that helped him the most never became a Muslim. Is that correct? Abu Talib, right? He never became a Muslim, right? But subhanallah, who helped the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa like Abu Talib? This is to show you that even a prophet, he needs to have a family, even if the family don't become Muslim. Still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him with a family, right? Individual cannot do nothing, nothing by themselves. If I ask anybody here, would you like to have your own island? Not your own house, your own island. With your own everything, you got everything. You got house, you got cars, you got everything, but it's your own island. But the, 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 and, and it's all paid for. We fly you out there with a helicopter, we drop you there, all the food is there, everything you need is there. The only thing you will not get while you're there is people. Nobody else is there. They say, this is your island. Stay there as long as you want. It's your island. Just enjoy yourself. Even you can, you, you want a sweetheart? You want your wife to be with you? Okay, then we still give you a wife. You, the lady, give her a husband. So the two of you is just out there together. How long you think you will stay on that island with no other people? 
I'm asking you, what do you think? This experiment, they did that. How, how long? Huh? Maximum. After 40 days, 45 days, 50 days, if you by yourself, you don't have somebody to talk to, you go crazy. That's it. You just go crazy. The human being requires what? Other human beings. So this dean is sent as a social religion, not an individual religion. So those three elements start with family. Then units of family become what? Community. Then when you have a community that's well disciplined, you have a community that's well endowed, you have a community that has good resources, you have a community that is very well disciplined, you have a community that they, they attract people and they have power, they establish institutions. Now you have something like the Mormons have in Utah. Anybody here been to Utah? Who? Who been to Utah? Utah, U-T-A-H. That's not on the moon, guys. Utah, where is it, brother? You been there? It's the only state in the United States of America which have, is under the control of a religion. There is no other state. People talking about the Yahudis, this and the Yahudis, that. The Yahudis ain't controlling no state in the United States of America. They got money, they doctors, they lawyers, they this, they that, they, some of them, Malayin, all of that there, but they ain't controlling no state. You ain't got no state that's the Jewish state. Do you notice any state? I'm not talking about people talking. I'm talking about a state where the universities, the highways, the colleges, the institutions, nobody can become a governor there except that religion. Which one? Which one is Jewish? Which one is Christian? Mormons, the Utah, is that right? Did they do it loud or quiet? Quiet. No one can become governor in that state if he's not a Mormon. Do you understand that? And those states that's around Utah, they controlling the economy of those states around Utah also. This means that those people is very powerful. Do you know how many Mormons is in this country? I'll give you the statistics now. In the whole world, there's only 15 million Mormons. In the United States, maybe only 5 million. That means Muslims outnumber the Mormons. And how long the Mormon faith been in the earth? Like 150 years. That's it. I mean, before 150 years, nobody know nothing about no Mormons. They got their own book. If you go to any hotel in the United States now, you find two books inside the drawer when you pull it out, right? It's right or wrong. You open up the drawer in a hotel, they used to only have the Bible. Now what they got inside? The Book of Mormon. Why they ain't got no Quran in there? The Muslims ain't talking went to nobody and told them, hey, you need to have a Quran in there. There's six million Muslims here. No, because we weak. The Mormons is strong. So the Mormons have the capability to be able to use their faith as leverage in the society. And, and uh, you know, their candidate, his name is Mitt Romney. You know that, right? He ran for president. But guess who he lost to? He lost to Obama, black man. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Mitt Romney, very wealthy. Come from a wealthy state, powerful people. But the way Allah structured it, he lost to a black man. Allahu Akbar. And not only that, not only did he lose to the black man, but the next year round, he didn't even run no more because he already knew he was going to lose again. That's the way Allah did it. Allah, he structured it so as to send a message to the American people that anybody can become president if he have enough votes. Is right or wrong? Is it right or wrong? So the next question is, how in the world could Donald Trump become the president with six million Muslims in this country. You know why? You know how they became him president? The pious Muslims, the knowledgeable Muslims, the ones who are holding the Quran and the Sunnah, who wear the turbans and they got the sajda mark and they got this and they belong to this and they belong to that, they stayed home. They didn't vote. Because they say, I ain't voting. I'm an American, I'm getting all the benefits of being an American, but I ain't no American. That's how Muslims be talking. I ain't no American, these Kafirs. What you in here for? If this is a Kafir country, why you here? 
Ain't nobody forced you to get here. Ain't nobody, somebody forced you out of your home. Somebody forced you out of your country, but nobody forced you to come to America, did they? And nobody forcing you to stay, right or wrong. So why are you staying? Because there is benefit. And only stupid people will leave a place where there is benefit to go to some other place. Even the Muslim who come here, he might be talking that he, oh man, Algeria, I'm from Al, Al Jazeera. You know me, I'm from Morocco, mashallah. You know me, I'm from Mecca, I'm from blah, blah, blah. But I guess what, if you get that green card and somebody tell you, okay, go back to your country. All of a sudden you say, what? What? This is my country, what are you talking about? Now all of a sudden the Muslim, he switch up now. Because no one will leave where there's benefit to go back to another place where he cannot or she cannot get the what? The benefit. I didn't say that America is the greatest country in the world. I didn't say that. I said it right now. This country has the best constitutional privileges for Muslims in the world. I said, what kind of privileges? Because you know, see what I just said about Donald Trump? Donald Trump is a tramp. Donald Trump is a criminal. Donald Trump is crazy. He's like a baboon, man, going wild. I don't know how he gets to the White, White House. But I'm on TV. I can talk like this here. Is anybody going to come in here and arrest us? Huh? No, nobody even think like that. But if you was in Egypt and you say, you know, Mursi, he crazy. Not Mursi, what, what other guy? Oh, Sisi, Sisi, like, like yes, yes in Spanish. Sisi, you know, so, hey, you know the guy, Sisi? The guy is crazy, man. He's Majnoon. Wallahi, Aki, if you said something like that, within 10 minutes, Aki, you going to jail and your whole family going to jail, right or wrong. Even in Egypt now, if you're walking down the street with a mushaf and a long beard, you might go to jail for that. So, here in America, if somebody want to travel, he want to run from New York to California with no clothes on, just a hat. There's a guy, he ran across America with no clothes on. He just waving at the people, he got no clothes on, just a hat. And everybody's waving, he don't get arrested. Because there's what they call individual freedom. We don't agree with that, right? We do not agree with that. However, he have his constitutional protection. Is right or wrong? You know, we got the people, they call themselves LGBTQZ. I add a Z to it. They add, I'll tell you why I add the Z. Because, you know, I can't say nothing bad about them because, you know, you might go to jail because, you know, they under constitutional privileges too. You know, the people, they men with men, men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women and men sleeping with boys and women sleeping with girls and men and women sleeping with dogs and I mean they, they get some crazy stuff man but they even call themselves LGBT they said no we also queer so they add a Q right say LGBT then last year they added the Q to it right they said no some of us is just queer so I add a Z to it when I had a discussion with them I said you guys is L LGBTQZ they said no we LGBTQ I said no I said you Z too they said what is Z I said, well, what you give to this country, its constitution, its benefit, the family, the family, the morality, the humanity, the benefit for the future is zero. So I add Z on the end of it. LGBTQ what? Z. Anyway, family, community, and nation. You cannot build a nation without a community, right? You cannot build a community without what? Family. Brothers and sisters, Islam encourages the individual, him or her, to use their God-given faith and resources to build their family, their community, and their nation. Now, I want to talk about something that you guys should listen very carefully about. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm going to use your city. Do you know how many churches is in this city? Okay, let's use that. I say over 2,000. Over 2,000 churches in this uh, city. Not the state, just the city. Okay, do you know that every church is the owner of property around the church? Do you know that? How many people know that? 
Every church, if they've been a church for like 100 years, they probably own 50, 60, 70 properties all around the church. It's right or wrong. If they're only a church for 10 years, they got 10, 15 properties. You say, how do they get the money to buy them properties? They're not going through the bank to buy the properties. How do they get the money? You know how they get the money? There's something called tithing. T-I-T-H-I-N-G. Who, who used to be a Christian in this room? Tell me what tithing is, brother. 10% of whatever God gives to you, you got to give it back to God, right? And the church is the representative of God, right? So if you don't pay the tithes, God will never answer your prayers, and that means you are cursed. Your money is cursed, your family is cursed, your prayers is not answered, and you cannot be a legitimate Christian. Is that correct? So you got gay people, drunk people, drug people, all kind of crazy people. They still paying tithes, right or wrong? So, you got 100 people inside the church, and the people make on an average of $35,000 a year, $40,000 a year. You ain't got to be no rocket scientist to understand that 10% of 40,000 is how much? 4,000. So if you got 100 families that's paying 4,000, how much is that a month? How much is that a, a, a year? 400,000. So you know to maintain a mosque this size, you only need at maximum 100,000. Is right, Chef? Just to maintain it, we ain't say to build it up and to do all the things you want to do, but 100,000, you can pay the taxes, and you ain't paying no taxes because you're 501c3, right? But to, for the gas and the electric, and to have a place and to keep it clean, and you know, all that there, and pay whatever you got to pay to buy the building and all that, $100,000 a year. So that means you gotta, if you got 100 families that's paying 4,000 a year, then you got, I mean, you got 300,000 at the end of the year, right? So in the course of 10 years, how much money did you collect? Three million, right? How many buildings can you buy? Houses can you buy for three million in Nashville in 10 years? So in 10 years, these mosques all over Nashville, what they bought, what they got. If you come here and you say, I need to have a, fa I need a house for my family, can the mosque offer you a house? If somebody's homeless, can the mosque say, okay, we got some 20 rooms over there for people just got out of prison, people who's in the hospital, people that are senior citizens, here we got a room for them, and the welfare will pay for it. Do the mosque have something like that? Why? Because we don't have what the Christians have. The Christians, they have something, not just they have a church, they also have what? They got a community. The YMCA, what's that mean? They call it the Y now, but it used, it's the real name is YMCA. What it means? Young men's, they have the YWCA too. So young men's and young women's, what? Christian Association. So in order to get everybody in there and you don't be feeling like you're being Christianized, they just call it the Y. You know, just like McDonald's, they don't even call it McDonald's no more. They call it Mickey D's. So you don't think you're supporting the McDonald family. And KFC, they don't even call it Kentucky Fried Chicken no more. What they call it? They call it KFC. See, you know America's like that. Get everybody involved, but you don't feel like you're supporting something in particular. Just give it a different name. So the YMCA is the biggest human service organization in America. The Salvation Army. You heard that before, right? Salvation Army and the YMCA, they're the biggest human service corporations in the United States of America. Where the Muslims fit in at? Where the, where the Muslims? Just because we don't have community. So I'm suggesting that the Muslims, the business people, the religious people, the concerned people, that you get together and you talk and you keep on talking until you come up with something that's like the tithes. Because somebody said, oh, Sheikh, isn't that bid'ah? Come on, man, don't be acting stupid. What are you talking about bid'ah? We ain't making no new religion. You know, you got a, you got a phone? Why are you using a phone? Ain't that bid'ah? Oh, you got a microwave in your house? Ain't that bid'ah? Oh, what else you got? Oh, look at the sisters are looking at that thing over there. We got the camels over there. Is, is that bid'ah? 
to do something that is progressive, something that is beneficial, something that harness our resources, something that we see other people is doing in America that give them benefit, give them resources, why we don't do it? Somebody said, well, you know, our religion is perfect religion, so we're supposed to be imitating other people. You know, some Muslims, they're gonna come like that, right? You, right? Right, 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 right? So I got something for them too. So I come back with them with this. I say, oh, brother or sister, did you read the seerah? Did you read the seerah very well? They said, yeah, yeah, I read the seerah. What are you, why, so what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, one day the messenger of Allah said, and the sheikh, he's here. So sheikh, you correct me if I say something wrong, right? So one day the messenger of Allah said, he was in Medina, and uh, he seen some people was celebrating something. And you know, he's a prophet, but he don't know everything, right? So he asked the people what they celebrating. They said, oh, Messenger of Allah, they practice celebrating something called Ashura. He said, what is that? He said, they celebrating the, when, when Musa and the Jewish people, when they was victorious over Fir'aun. Huh? SubhanAllah, that's what they celebrating. So what did the Prophet say? We have more right to celebrate that tradition than they do. So today, is Ashura a part of Islam? I'm asking you. So if the Christians, Allah says, verily the Christians, the, the Christians and the Jews, the Ahl al-Kitab and the Jews, verily they friends and protectors of each other. Didn't Allah say that? They friends and protectors of each other. And O Muslims, unless you do this, meaning that unless you do what they do, that you stick together, you be friends of one another, you support one another, there'll be great facade and fitna in the earth. That means it would not be good for us, right? So if they got tithes, we don't have to call it tithes. We can call it a community commitment. Say that word. So if somebody said, let's make a community commitment agreement. Let's make a community commitment agreement for all the Muslims in the United States. A community commitment agreement. So we're not giving the money to the Imam. We're not giving the money for the mosque. We're giving the money as a community commitment agreement across the line. All, all Muslims agree to this. And when they come into Islam, you don't have to. We ain't saying it's wajib on you. We ain't saying it's farid on you. But guess what? If you really want to support Islam, and you want to support Islam in America, and you want to support the community, we recommend that you enter also the agreement with the community. Wouldn't that be good? A community commitment agreement because it applied to everybody even if you on welfare if you on welfare or farewell whatever you want still you get money in America right I don't care what you on in America you getting some kind of money give up 10% of whatever God gives you cross the board you will see that within five years time the presence of community will be there because people that pay 10%, guess what? Guess what? They want to be involved, right? They want to be there. That's my church. That's my, that's my minister. That's my church. This is my religion. Even if it's once a year, they're going to be involved because they're giving up what? 10%. Now, if you don't feel strong enough about Islam to give up 10%, you have to ask yourself really what you really want to do. What is it you really want to invest in? The other thing I just want to say to the brothers and sisters is somebody will say, oh, Sheikh, there's already zakah. Allah already, uh, Allah already ordered us to pay zakah. Well, guess what? You not living under no zakah system. There is no Amir. There is no Dawla. There is no Amir to order the people to collect the zakah. There is no Dola that we know about where the people will be accountable to pay zakah. And therefore, if I ask the Imam of any masjid, how many people come give you the same thing they give to the IRS? Sheikh, anybody did that? Say, Sheikh, this is what I paid the IRS, and I'm giving the same report to you, and I'm paying my zakah. Bam. Did anybody do that? No, you know why? Because they respect the IRS. Does anybody here don't know what the IRS is? Maybe I got to tell you. You don't know what the IRS is? 
You know because if you don't pay, you go to jail. And that's why you pay. And guess what? Abu Bakr, an, he said the same thing. Whoever don't pay the zakat, he'll kill you, take you captive, okay, and take the money. This is what Abu Bakr said, right? So this means the zakat is a part of Islam and Muslims is not paying zakat. And we'd be wondering to why we're not successful, why Allah don't answer our prayers. If we don't pay zakat, at least minimally, maybe Allah will, will uh, excuse us because we don't have no dola, no amir or whatever, but we pay in a community commitment, agreement. Maybe Allah, he will accept that for us like it's almost like zakat. It's not zakat, but because there's no dola, no amir, nobody to collect, nobody to enforce. So at least the Muslims say, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm paying my community commitment and I'm doing, uh, we paying like the Christians is paying because that's the system they're using. It works here in America. It should work also for us. So we had to come up with something. So somebody said, oh, Chef, 10% is too much. Okay, good. Let's go down to seven. Oh, that's too much. Okay, let's go to five. The bottom line is the people keep making excuses because at the end of the day, they don't want to pay what? Nothing. So nothing from nothing is what? What? I mean, when I went to school, nothing for nothing is nothing. But I don't know, maybe y'all went to a different school. I don't know. Okay. So brothers and sisters, we Muslim Americans are the envy of every Muslim in the world. Do you know why we the envy of every Muslim in the world? Because we have the greatest faith system, that's number one. And we live in a country that gives us the constitutional privilege to implement our faith. That's why we are the envy of Muslims all over the world. We have a lot of challenges. We need to make Islam relevant and functional in the society where we live. We need to understand the dynamics. We need to make Islam relevant and functional to the society where we live. What's the two words I said? Huh? It's just very important. You have to make Islam relevant and functional to the society where you live in that. Not relevant and functional, you know, something to some back, something back home. We need to understand the dynamics between Islam and the Constitution of the United States of America. No, Islam, we got our own constitution, right? The Quran and the Sunnah. But this country have its own laws, just like the Muslims that went to Habash. They was Muslims following the Quran, following the Sunnah, but in the society that they made hijrah to, they also had to follow the law of that society. Is that correct or not? I'm, is it correct or not? So Muslims also have to understand that we have Islam and we have our constitutional values and they have to complement. We don't say they all have to agree, but we have to make the best that bring the constitutional values to into like this here, so that minimally Muslims are known that we obey the law. Now nobody told us that we have to live next to, nobody said that we have to work for, nobody have to say we have to marry, live with, no LGBTQZ people. They didn't say that. They just said that they got rights like we got rights. That's all they said, right? I don't agree with it. But guess what? I have to tolerate it because it's part of the society. Next thing, we need to know the difference between culture and Islam. If you don't know the difference between your culture and Islam, then guess what? That's why you don't know the difference between McDonald's and halal food. Because culture doesn't mean Islam. Just because you say, you know, so I'm going, brother told me the other day, he said, Sheikh, I'm tired of this country. I'm, I'm leaving these Kafirs. I'm, going, I'm, I'm making Hijra to an Islamic country. I said, where? Where you saying going? He said, I'm going to Islamic country. I said, well, what country are you going to? He said, I'm making Hijra to Saudi Arabia. And I'm, I said, so where are you going to live in the Haram? Where are you going to live in the Haram in Medina? You're going to live in the Haram in Mecca? So you're going to leave your passport here? So, I mean, you tired of these Kafirs. I know you ain't got no round trip ticket if you're making Hijra. So you're going to leave your passport here. Just you go on Hijra, go to the airport, and at the airport, you're leaving your passport there and you're going. Is that what you're going to do? 
He said, I didn't say that. Said, what you doing? What are you talking about? By the end of the conversation, what you think he really meant? First of all, I asked him, where is the Islamic country? Secondly, did you ask the Saudi Arabian embassy, or the, can you go there and live? Did you ask them that? No. So how are you going to just go somewhere and live if you ain't ask nobody? They, you got to get a visa for Hajj, man. You got to get a visa to make Umrah. And if you ain't got $100,000 in the bank, you ain't getting no visa for no business. So how are you going to make Hijra there if that's an Islamic country? So he had to rethink that out. Like most of us had to rethink it out. Just because you came from a Muslim country doesn't mean that that country is Islamic. And even if you say it is, there's a difference between the culture of that country and the culture and the rules of Islam. You know that, right? Second thing, we need to talk about so social and political empowerment. Because, you know, these young kids, our children, as we speak here right now, brothers and sisters, I'm gonna wrap this up in the next three minutes. Your children are gonna be taught in the schools. They're rewriting all the textbooks right now that gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, queer people is good people. They good examples. You gotta respect them. Even you can marry them. They good people and you should try. They, they, some of them is our heroes. They writing it now inside all the books. So now what you gonna tell little Fatima when she come home? What you gonna tell little Ahmed when he come home? And maybe the teacher who's teaching is a queer. They teaching her right now. Hey, what your father's telling you? You know what I mean? You, you, it's okay, it's a good lifestyle. See me, I'm checking. This is my husband. It's a man saying it, this is my husband. And there's a lady, it's a teacher saying, that's my, that's my wife. So, what? That's what they teaching Ahmed? They teaching Fatima? So if you don't have your own schools, you ain't got no money, you don't got your own community, you ain't got your own hospitals, you ain't got your own place where you buy your food, you don't have your own apartments, you ain't got your own courts, you don't have, just like the Jews, they got their own courts. You know that, right? The ones that wear the things like this here, they got their own courts. You don't be seeing them in the regular courts with us. So this America, we have to be involved. If you're not involved, you're gonna find out that other people that you don't like, that you have big difference with, they're gonna be the ones that's the teachers and the judges and the police and all the, the, the scientists and all that, they're gonna be in charge. So where that leave us at? The last thing. There were 60, according to most uh, books of Sirah, there were 68 or 70 major companions. How many? Major, we're talking about major companions. 68 or 70. And if you add the Hawla Rasulullah if you add the women, also more, more than that. Of them, how many of them do you think was business people and how many of them you think was people that was like poor, they ain't had no money? Give me an answer, somebody. How many? Huh? Excuse me? No, no. No. The majority of them were business people. Out of the 70, you can say 60 of them were all business people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not start this deen with poor people. No, Allah, he give honor to the poor people. He give a special status to the poor people. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep him among the poor people. He didn't say to keep him poor, but he said to keep my honor among the poor people and that the poor people stay close to him. But it didn't mean that Allah sent this religion for the people to be poor. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Al Mu'minu Kawi, Khairun wa Habbu il Allah min al Mu'minu Da'if. You heard that hadith? This is what the Prophet said. When the Prophet had to ask for money to go out to make a, 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 a rihla for, 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 uh, for jihad, who he's asking for money? What he, who he's asking for money? Abu Huraira, radiallahu an? He's asking Bilal, radiallahu an? They ain't got no money. They got something else, but they don't have money. When the Prophet got to Medina, Munawwara, who's got the money? Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Talha ibn Zubair, they got the money. Abu, I mean, Abu Talha, they got the money. So who the Prophet is asking to help build or do this or that? He's asking the people who have what? Money. 
So brothers and sisters, if you look at the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu you see from the very beginning, the one that took care of the Prophet Sallallahu first it was his grandfather, right? What was his name? Abdul Muttalib. Was he poor or was he a businessman? After that, his son, Abu Talib, who took care of the Prophet was he poor or he was a businessman? Okay, and after he was working with Abu Talib, didn't he find the lady Khadija say, I want to hire him. And she's what? She's a poor lady or she's an orphan or she's business, which one? So that became his wife, right? So when, when he could no longer be a merchant, he can't be a businessman because he's receiving the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah already give him somebody to be with him who got what? Huh? Money. Then his best friend, the first one that came to join him, who was that? Huh? Abu Bakr, he poor, he got money. After that, Usman, he's poor, he got money. Huh? What? So we just keep going on, going, 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 going. You'll find that 60, 60 of the major companions, they was all business people. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants to support this people. He wants to support this deen first with what? With people who have resources. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, and this is, a, some people said, the majority of the scholars said it's a weak hadith. And so I'm not going to, you know, say it's not a weak hadith, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's a hadith. He said, the Prophet says that teach your children business because business has 99% of the halal risk of the Bani Adam. So business, teach your children business. Send them to school to go get a degree, but before you do that, teach them what? Business. So Muslims have to learn the importance of doing business. We should have businesses all around this masjid. Businesses should be filling up all outside the space where we pray and ain't no classrooms. Business! Outside, we own business. All these shops and all everywhere. Business, the Muslims should be doing. Because if you're doing business, you're not going to be the slaves of anybody. Do you understand that? Okay, brothers and sisters, look. You know, me, I'm writing about this here a lot. I had a lot to tell you, but sometimes you can't say what you want to say in an hour. So I, I have to submit to the time. And I said a lot in the time that I had, and I appreciate you listening to me. And I also appreciate you coming forward and sitting the way you're sitting. And I know I said a lot of things that you didn't hear before. And if I say something that you don't like, blame the imam. He's the one that gave me permission to be here. Secondly, if I had time to stay here, I would say more. And if I lived in this city, I would do more. And if somebody gave me some power, I'd push you right up to the walls. Because guess what? You get no juice if you don't press the, the, the lemon or, the, or the, the, the orange or whatever. You don't get nothing, that's right? So we ask Allah to bless the imam. We ask Allah to bless the administration. We ask Allah to bless the teachers and the elders. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that some of the people will listen to what I said and they start thinking about community. Not just the prayer, not just the Juma'ah, not just the school, not just to take some benefit for yourself, but to establish a real community. And to do that, you gotta make an individual commitment. That's why the Prophet said, marriage is half of the faith. Why he said that? Why marriage is half the faith? Why, because you're gonna sleep with, you got somebody to sleep with? No, marriage is half of the faith because that's when you learn responsibility. That's when you learn accountability. That's when you become more stable and more reliable. That's why the Prophet said that marriage is half of the faith. So if marriage is half the faith, then that means having a family is half of the community, right or wrong. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all of us will benefit from what's been said. And if you start thinking, make some istikhara about establishing a community commitment. And regarding the suggestion that I made, that's just my suggestion. I'm traveling from town to town, city to city, state to state. I'm making the same suggestions. Maybe in the course of some time, some people will implement it. And I get my reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, Let's take 10 or 15 minutes of some questions. Now look, brothers or sisters, if you got a question, don't be asking me nothing about some foolishness that's happening somewhere else in the world. Don't be asking me about Palestine. Don't be asking me about what's going on in Yemen. Don't ask because I don't know, I don't know what happened with Osama and Obama. I don't know, you understand me, about all the other stuff that's going on. Don't be asking me no questions. Sisters, don't be asking me about your husband and your problem in your marriage. Brothers, don't be asking me, you know, send me something. 
ask me about what I talked about. If you got a question about what I talked about, ask the question. Now, if you got your own statement you want to make, then ask the permission from the imam and give your own talk. What I say? If you got your own statement you want to make, get permission from the imam and make your own talk. But if you didn't understand something I said, and you got a question for clarification, it's my obligation to answer that. But it's got to be relevant to the topic. Everybody got that? Good. So if there's some sisters over there got a question, write it down, sis. You can ask the question. And if you're really brave, you can just stand up and just ask the question. I don't care. I, I answer that too. So anybody got questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah.